Uncanny X-Men number 186 is titled Life Death, and it is a doozy. It deals with Storm coming to terms with her recent power loss, and she discovers that the man she's starting to fall for emotionally is also the creator behind the instrument of her demise. I first read this issue when I was a kid, and I remember not liking it one bit. I remember that I didn't even want to buy it because I was super turned off by the cover art. It just looked stoic and plain and not exciting to me in the least. I think I held off from purchasing it until I exhausted like a bunch of other options of more exciting looking covers, which for me was pretty much anything from the Outback era. I eventually caved and I did buy this one, but when I did read it, I remember being so bored because I felt like nothing happened in it. Back then, I only craved action and adventure in my comic books, and this issue did not give me any of that. In hindsight, I was a fool for thinking that this issue was anything less than extraordinary, because revisiting it now as an adult, I can easily see how it's one of the best Storm stories out there. And not just a great Storm story, but a really well-crafted single-issue story in general. It's classic storytelling from start to finish, with peaks and valleys of emotional highs and emotional lows for all the characters. Yes, it's a slow burn with chunks of dialogue to slog through as Storm rebuilds her life, but the payoff at the end where Storm's world comes crashing down again around her, only for her to come out of it totally stronger than before, is totally worth it. Everything about the issue feels special to me now, and I can totally see why it's a must-read for any X-Fan. Like, even just holding it and feeling its thickness between my fingers gives me anticipation. It's one of those special double-sized issues, and even though double-sized issues feel like a dime a dozen sometimes, there's something that just feels right about this particular story being giant-sized. Editorially, I think that Marvel probably could have tightened up some of the story by condensing Storm and Forge's scenes together, but I'm really glad that they didn't, and I thoroughly enjoyed taking the long road with these characters. Even though the lengthy dialogues didn't appeal to me as a kid, I'm totally drawn into Storm and Forge's romantic courtship as an adult, and I loved watching the mounting sexual tension and awkwardness grow between them. The pacing of this issue is definitely one meant for more mature readers, and while it lacks the momentum that I usually crave in comic books, I thought it was a great read that was rife with both drama and excitement in its own unique way. Here are the highlights for me from Uncanny X-Men number 186. Storm Storm is the backbone, front bone, and entire body of this story. She has been rescued by Forge after Henry Gyrick hit her with the power neutralizer in the previous issue, and he's tending to both her physical and mental well-being, but she isn't making it easy for him. She starts this issue off being super depressed. Her connection with Mother Nature has been severed and it's taking a serious toll on her. She won't eat, she won't move, she won't do anything that constitutes living except to breathe. Her relationship with the weather was such a defining part of her self-identity, and now that that connection's gone, it's like part of her has been killed. Or at least that's how she feels. We all know Storm to be a very vivacious and emotive character. She's not hyperactive like Kitty Pride or Jubilee, but she does express the entire emotional spectrum in her own way. She feels things extremely deeply, and her emotional responses, be them happy or angry or in this case sad, are always made with intent. It's so soul-crushing to be a fan of hers and to see her in such a pathetic heap on the bed. This is not the strong goddess that we are used to seeing. But at the same time, knowing what we know of this character, this is probably the most natural response for her to make given her new circumstances. There's no way she could have just shrugged off being depowered and walked away with her head held high. That wouldn't have made any sense at all for her character. Part of her has been destroyed and Storm has got to feel that. This arc is all about her having to rediscover herself and it really ties in nicely with her current leather phase. It's like she's already been upgrading her personality and now she has to kick it into overdrive with this new complication. She's been exploring new facets of herself, and it's been a period of adjustment for everyone, but now it's like her true test of character is only really beginning. It will be a challenge to see if she can consolidate this latest, powerless version of herself into the myriad identities that she's recently been exploring. 
Even though the issue starts off with Storm being too depressed to do anything at all, she does eventually rouse, and we spend most of the rest of the issue watching her and Forge get to know one another. They haven't met before, so to Storm, Forge is just a guy who happened to save her from drowning, but it's pretty clear that there's an immediate attraction between them. The building action of their getting to know each other is definitely the slow burn of the issue. The narrative literally creates like a budding romance between them, and it's totally lovely because it feels like they are just on one big long extended date all issue long. They associate with each other in super relatable ways. They're cooking dinner, talking about their problems, going for a swim. They're doing real stuff that we all do in our real lives, and they're discovering each other on a really human level as opposed to something through super heroics. But then all hope for their happiness is dashed away at the climax of the issue when it's revealed that Forge is Storm's ultimate Judas. He invented the device that stripped her of her powers and he's still in cahoots with the governments that used it on her. It's such a betrayal to Storm. She has just begun to come to terms with her new situation and she's been opening up her heart all issue long to this guy who is effectively the instrument of her pain. It's terrible, and Storm reacts harshly to the news, but it also finally frees her. It wakes her up and gives her the spirit that she's been lacking all issue long. She refuses to be delivered by him to the government like some sort of lab rat, and she gives Forge a piece of her mind. She also punches him and lays down a savage burn by saying that he's just a hollow form without substance. Youch! She's been reinvigorated, and she's finally ready to reclaim control over her life. This whole issue is really just a journey for Storm in coming to terms with the new her. It's transformative and she goes from being a depressed, lifeless mess to walking away in confidence and accepting her new powerless status quo. We got to see her flirt a little, we got to see her smile, we got to see her cry, and we got to see her get down and get real. If this issue doesn't encapsulate all that Storm possibly is, then I don't know what issue does. It's a whole new beginning for Storm, and depowering her was a great complication and an even better way to breathe some new life into her character. Forge Forge is a pretty morally gray guy in this issue. On one hand, he's tending to Storm and trying to help her heal body and soul, but on the other hand, he's the one who put her in this situation in the first place. He's also kinda sorta holding her in escrow until Henry Gyrick and the government inevitably come collecting for her. He's super blind to the government's vested interest in mutant subjugation, which is crazy because he's a mutant himself. He's not really a naive character overall, so it's weird that he can't see through the government, but I think that they're trying to portray him as more like the selfish type here. He's not thinking about the big picture and how his actions can affect all of mutant kind, and really, he's fine doing whatever they want so long as he gets to tinker with his toys and collect his paycheck. After he admits to Storm that he created the power neutralizer weapon, she calls him out for helping to abet the government's anti-mutant hysteria. Why would he even invent a weapon that could turn mutants into humans? It would inevitably fall into the wrong hands and be used against them in violence, which is exactly what happened against Storm. In Forge's defense, it's not like he created the weapon with the intention of it to ever be used against his own people this way. It was created to take care of the invading Dire Wraith aliens, and was fashioned after Rom's power neutralizer device. Rom is the Dire Wraith's nemesis, so on a surface level, this seemed like a good idea at the time. But I guess it was kind of naive of him to think that the government wouldn't also use this kind of weapon to further their own agendas as well. He tries to use logic in his argument with Storm. He indicates that if he's the one who created the weapon that stripped her of her powers, then he should be able to create a device that'll undo the effect too. She's not too interested in listening to logic though. She's been betrayed and she doesn't give a damn about Forge's rationalizations. He wants her to trust him, but how can she trust someone when the foundation of their very relationship was built on a deception? I like Forge as a character because I think that they give him a way cool personality for someone with his passive power set. 
His mutant power is that he basically just has a knack for inventing things, and I'll admit, as a kid, I really didn't care about him. He's not flashy, and all of his charm is dialogue-driven, so for like a nine-year-old me, that just translated as lackluster. Nowadays, I appreciate him a lot more, and I love his wit. I'm still not very interested in his wartime stories, though, but that's just me. He goes into some detail with Storm about his past, and later we see holograms from the war in Vietnam, and I just find it mind-numbingly boring, because that's just how I find most war stories. At least his stories have some interesting mystical and demonic aspects to them. Storm sees a flash of those in the hologram that she ends up running through later, and even though we don't really learn anything more about these aspects yet, it gives me hope that there's something fantastical to come out of his time that he spent in Vietnam. Forge's holograms overall are super gorgeous, and his penthouse is hella pimped out. It has floating platforms and stairwells, and looks like something that would be the ultimate party pad. Storm keeps falling off the platforms when she's trying to escape, and I can only imagine the death trap that this place becomes when Forge is stumbling home drunk at 3am after the club. I was really surprised that they didn't prolong this initial Forge and Storm courtship. It really began and ended with this one issue. I know that she and Forge end up having an on-off sort of relationship for a few years, but we basically watch the entire life cycle of their first tryst in this one issue. They learn about each other on their big long date, and they share their first kiss, and then they even have their first breakup by the end of it. Forge proclaims his feelings for Storm when they're fighting and she's threatening to leave. I just find it weird that he says that he'll always care for her when he's known her for what, like a few days? I don't mind that it was a fast love instead of a long love, because a single contained issue is so nice to read, but they really go for broke with the love at first sight trope here. It feels like a contemporary comic would have them prolong this relationship and really draw out the romance, and then have Storm find out about Forge's Judas moment a few issues later. But I gotta respect that the creative team here said nah and just gave it all away in this big double sized issue. I guess if you've got plans and intentions for where you want the story to go and how you want to develop it, then there's no need to prolong and stretch out one single solitary plot point over several issues. I gotta give him mad props for that. Even though Forge is like the quasi-villain of this issue, I really liked his portrayal and I loved the complicated love-hate setup that they created with him and Storm. I think it was a great platform off of which to launch his debut into the X-World. Val Cooper. Val is still on the hunt for Rogue in this issue. She meets with her government agent friend and he gives her an update saying that they still haven't found her. We get more insight into Val's character through him and he feels sympathy for Val because bringing in Rogue was supposed to be Val's big break, but it's been nothing but a mess. I, on the other hand, don't feel any sympathy for Val. I don't think we're meant to either, but I do get the sense that they're trying to make her seem a bit more, like, relatable or something now. Like, everyone knows how it feels to be passed up for a promotion, so if they give Val that attribute, then maybe it makes her seem less detestable. It doesn't do the trick for me, though, and Val still leaves a bad taste in my mouth. At the very least, I can admit that she's got some gumption, and she shows it when the dire race infiltrate her motel room. She has no reason to suspect that her friend has been replaced by an alien, so she lets him in without hesitation, but then almost falls victim to the other dire race that are standing there waiting to attack her. They really have it out for Val if there's three of them that are staging this attack. Rogue ends up breaking it up and Val is saved, but it turns out that Val isn't helpless in her own right. She throws down some serious self defense styled moves that totally remind me of the talent demonstration Gracie Lou Freebush gave in Miss Congeniality, and she immobilizes the alien posing as her friend and demands information from it. The Wraith isn't very forthcoming though, and Val just gets more threats out of it, so she wastes no time in shooting it and escapes from the hotel. She knows that if the Wraiths don't get her, then Rogue certainly will, so she gets out of there while she can. I like watching Val on the run. There's a funny scene where she hijacks a car and has to maneuver it through a crowded parking lot. She slams into a lot of cars while she makes her getaway. It's a desperate woman doing what she's gotta do to save her own hide, and I like it. Val is always in the pursuit of self-interest and survival. It might be because of her governmental background that she's always on her haunches. It can't be easy being a woman in the old boys club, especially probably not during this era but I'm not looking to give her any handouts. 
I think she's so guarded, and even if she's not looking to be a hero in any way, I think it was pretty shitty that she left Rogue alone to deal with the other two wraiths in the hotel room by herself. Granted, running away and escaping is probably the best and smartest move for someone like her, but I just felt like it could have been a redeeming moment for her character to step up and show Rogue that she's not a bad person at heart. Instead, Val's only thought is, Rogue will come after me next, so she books it. It's Val putting herself ahead of others, and it's exactly why I think Val is such an unlikable character. Rogue Rogue is awesome in this issue. She's only in it for a few pages, but she kicks some serious ass while she's there. After the tugboat explosion at the end of the last issue, Rogue fell into the Mississippi River and was assumed to have either drowned or escaped. She shows up alive and well in this issue and bursts into Val's hotel room when the dire rates are attacking. I love how badass she is at beating up these ugly aliens. She drop kicks, she punches, she knows it's time to throw down, and she does. What makes her a hero in this scene is that she's putting Val's welfare ahead of her own revenge. The only reason she's at Val's room is to give her some payback and to find out what they did to Storm, but she immediately sees that Val is in trouble and she knows that she has to help her. That's the heart of a hero. She could have just let the diorites take her and then search for info on Storm from some other government agent, but that's something the old rogue would have done. This is not the same rogue who was a member of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. Rogue pretty much came to terms with her new heroic impulses last issue, and now she knows that she's not faking it when she feels that she has to help people. She really does care about saving people now, and in this case, even saving people who she hates. She takes the diorates out of commission, but by that point Val has already escaped. In a way that also just hammers home a lesson of being a superhero for Rogue. Sometimes your own revenge just has to be pushed aside for the sake of doing the greater good. She absorbs some diorite psychic energy and it does a bit of a number on her, but she recovers quickly and then the next thing we know, she's hiding in the backseat of Val's getaway car. With the aliens out of her way, now there's nothing stopping Rogue from finally getting some information out of Val. She uses her power to incapacitate Val and drain some of her psyche and energy and the car ends up crashing into some trees. Sure, she could have just asked or demanded Val give her the information, but it would have taken a lot of persuasion, and honestly, who's got time for that? Instead, Rogue takes the direct approach by absorbing the information straight out of her, consent be damned. Even though I was just going on about how Rogue is honing into her heroic impulses, I was happy to see that Rogue doesn't consider herself too good for revenge yet. Rogue may be becoming a hero, but she's not so high and mighty yet as to neglect to give payback to someone when it's deserved. Rogue learns that the power neutralizer was meant for her and not for Storm, and feels guilty about what happened, so she heads back to the mansion to fill Xavier in on all the details. Rogue was just so cool in this issue, and her action scenes were totally a highlight for me in an otherwise fairly slow-paced story. Diorates. So, I don't know a whole lot about the Diorates. I know that they are the arch-nemesis of the Space Knight Rom, but Rom is a Marvel character that I also don't really know a lot about. I think Marvel might have wanted Rom to take off in the 80s, hence the sort of tie-in to this issue with the Diorates. I haven't done any research on him yet, but the clunky look of him makes me feel like Rom was a toy that was being released, and Marvel was doing its darndest to market the toy via these comics. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's just the impression that I get. The diorites are pretty cool though. They are super ugly alien females who speak perfect English but with like witchy undertones. They have alien magic and are here to take over Earth in true invasion of the body snatchers fashion. I love that they have a vendetta against Val. To me, this is like two villains fighting each other, and I love it when that happens. I know the Wraiths have a grudge against her, but if you ask me, Val really isn't worth all this trouble. I mean, they just lost three diorites in this one attempt alone to get her. Clearly, they want to make an example of her, or maybe it's just that they want to use her government influence to help them better infiltrate Earth. Seems like a really roundabout way of doing things though, because with all of their power, it feels like they could just stage a pretty impressive invasion on their own, but hey, you do you girls. 
When I first read the diorites, they came across as just another random alien species in the multitude of Marvel's alien species, so I honestly didn't really care about them that much. Rereading them now though, I appreciate the aspects that set them apart from the other alien life forms. I like that they are all females, and I like that their speech patterns have that witchy formality to them. I look forward to seeing what the diorites will have in store as this saga goes on. Panels. There were a lot of great panels in this issue, especially with the beautiful artwork by Barry Windsor Smith. And it was hard to do, but I've managed to narrow down to my top five panels that I thought were cute or clever or crazy in this issue. Five. Storm noticing Forge's prosthetics for the first time. I really liked how they communicated Storm's body language here without having her say anything. She's clearly surprised and had no idea that Forge was missing a leg when she challenged him to her swimming race. Next time, she might think twice before she taunts him for losing. Four. Storm trying on her pretty pink dress and wondering what Forge will think of it. It feels so off character for Storm to be caring about what a man thinks of her appearance, and that's what stands out about this scene for me. It feels like it's the first time we've ever seen Storm care about anything as superficial as looks. She's always been so above the board when it comes to these innately human things, so to see her give a damn really makes her a lot more accessible to the reader. 3. Storm trying champagne for the first time. Her reaction is so pure. She tells Forge that it tickles her nose and then immediately asks for more. For a girl who doesn't drink, she sure did develop a taste for the good stuff quickly. She ends up drinking more as the years go on, and there's a great scene from a recent Ten of Swords crossover where she and Wolverine are drinking in a bar, and she's totally slurring her words and ends up flirting with him. Goddess, what a lush storm becomes. Two. Val trying gracelessly to maneuver through the parking lot as she escapes Rogue and the Dire Race. She's banging into every innocent parked car nearby, and she doesn't give a single damn about it. That's the government for ya. One. Nothing is better than watching Storm punch out Forge. Since she can't use her powers, everything's gonna be physical with her from now on. Something about this panel makes me feel like this is the moment when she readily owns her new powerless state and decides not to be a victim of the power neutralizer any longer. My favorite noise lettering in this issue was so hard to pick out because there was a lot of great stuff, but I've decided to highlight this It's when the lightning storm crashes through Forge's window and shatters glass everywhere. It's an unusual choice splattering of letters, and I'm not really sure how to pronounce it, but the way that they've been stylized, it clearly indicates that there's some sort of electricity on glass sound happening here. The lettering is also perfectly placed above Storm, so that it's clear that she had to duck to avoid getting sliced up by these shards of glass during the explosion. Sachisha! Fashion. Storm serves a lot of looks in this issue, and I really love them all. She wears a bedsheet, a swimsuit, a pretty pink dress, and then finally a pair of overalls. They are all unusual for her a bit, and none of them are your typical superhero fashion fair. I'm not sure, but I wonder if there was something metaphorical in all of her outfit changes in this issue. It's like she was changing in and out of clothes to mirror her emotional journey of accepting the new her. The bedsheets are most definitely the raggiest of the bunch, and it's when she's at her rock bottom. While she's flirting with Forge, she's dressed in that pretty pink dress. And then she's most comfortable in the overalls, which is what she's wearing when she finally accepts the new her. Of all the looks, I actually think I liked the bedsheet the most, if only because it's so daring. The only thing holding it up is that fold just above her chest, and it honestly feels the most storm to me in that she doesn't even really like wearing clothes at all to begin with. That's me talking about the old storm though, the storm who was a weather goddess. And since that's the storm that she's still wanting to be whilst she wears the bedsheet, I think the metaphor kind of holds up here. I gotta give a shout out to Rogue too. I love that she went to battle in what is probably the most uncomfortable thing a superhero could wear. 
She's wearing a tight yellow blouse, and it looks like it would be super starchy and too stiff to even throw a punch in. It's tucked into a pair of regular blue jeans, which are fine, but she drop kicks a diorate in them, so I can't see how they didn't rip. I can barely ride a bike in my jeans without ripping a hole somewhere along my legs, so I guess maybe she just has better technique than I do. Forge is taking the cake in men's fashion again for this issue. He's got such a great wardrobe when it comes to casual wear. I love this first outfit he wears, which is really just a yellow muscle shirt and a pair of blue track pants that have a white stripe down the side on either leg. It's totally my style, and that's probably why I like it. I appreciate that it looks like Forge actually upcycled this shirt, because it looks like it might have been a shirt with some sleeves on it at one point. I think he just took some scissors and cut them off. I turn a lot of old shirts into tank tops and stuff, so I can appreciate a guy who knows how to take his closet and make something from nothing out of it. Who knew that Forge's mutant power of creative ingenuity would extend to his fashion senses too? Ads. This issue, I'm highlighting the Dragon Tales ad. It's a choose-your-own-adventure type book brand that gives you the choice of two epic fantasy adventures. You can play for heart and sword in the Sword Daughter's Quest, or go on an epic hunt for a troll's treasure in Rune's World. I was a big, big, big fan of Goosebumps' choose-your-own-ending books growing up. I ordered a ton of them from my Scholastic book fairs, and I would read every possible ending I could. I've never heard of Dragon Tales, but I did know of a cartoon with a similar name, though I doubt they share any similarities since it was a preschool cartoon. I don't mind a good fantasy-filled adventure, so I actually think these Dragon Tales books might have been pretty fun to read. The artwork on both of them looks neat, and I mean, at $1.95, the price is just unbeatable. You've ensnared me, Dragon Tales, but I wonder, where can I find you now? X-Mail There is no X-Mail in this issue. This seems to be a recurring theme, and I guess they only publish letters on an alternating schedule, though I swear I remember seeing them in more issues than they seem to be appearing in. Regardless, no X-Mail this issue, so we'll just have to catch up with the crazy fans in the next one. Well, that's it for this one. Thanks for tuning in and listening to me ramble on. Feel free to subscribe for more of these reviews, or check out any of my other X content at my social media accounts. You can also find videos, blog posts, panel scans, and more at my website, greatexmentations.com. Thanks again for stopping by today, and be sure to come back soon for more Great Xmentations.